What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I am Scott Baer, joined, as always, by Tori McElhaney and Chris Rim. We are coming to you live from Highmark Stadium in Orchard Park, New York. There is snow on the ground. For a long time, there was a big sign that said playoff bound because yeah. the Buffalo Bills clinched a playoff berth at the exact moment that the Atlanta Falcons were mathematically il- eliminated as clocks struck zero following a 29-15 to 15 victory by the Bills. We are going to break this thing down in so many different ways, as we always do on the Final Whistle podcast. On the final whistle podcast, if I can the say that tongue, right, tongue twister, right tongue there. twister, it is so many F's. Um, and really, we're going to follow the same format that you guys always know, and we're going to address four different topics over the course of five minutes each. And we are going to break down obviously that pip- that pivotal fourth quarter sequence of events involving Matt Ryan not getting into the end zone and then getting called for a a taunting. We are going to talk about Kyle Pitts' day and his absence. We are going to talk about the defensive uh, takeaways that are really kind of skyrocketing right now, and we're going to look forward to the season finale against the New Orleans Saints. Before we start all that, Tori McElhaney, biggest takeaway for you uh, after the Falcons drop one to Buffalo. Outside of me not hating Buffalo, question mark. Right. I actually, I okay, so the last time you heard me, I was incredibly distraught about coming to Buffalo, New York on January 1st. However, now that we've been here for almost 48 hours, I don't hate it. We've had a really good trip. We ate some bomb wings we did. at this place called Gabriel's Gate. Chris um, would have loved them. Chris would have Guaranteed. loved them. <laughs> um, and also got to see my first like snow game which was really fun because honestly like I feel like that's a staple of coming to Buffalo New York for a Buffalo Bills game so I was actually pretty pleased with the ambiance of all of this Mm -hmm. now the game itself which is a just pivotal downturn Mm -hmm. from where I was feeling coming into this game uh there were so many things that I kind of took away from this game. It's super difficult for me to pick just one. Uh, I think it was just most, and I know Chris wrote about this post game, but to me, the biggest takeaway was the fact that this offense didn't have its weapons, and we really saw how important some of those weapons are, right. i.e., Kyle Pitts, i.e., Hayden Hurst. Uh, I would even go as far as to say, this game could have potentially been different if Calvin Ridley's out there. Uh, you take some of the pressure off of Cordero Patterson. So that, to me, was, I think, my biggest takeaway for this game. Yeah, and uh, what about for you, Chris? Yeah, I would just say missed opportunities. Well, missed missed opportunity, maybe the one that I'm thinking about uh, that we'll talk about later. But I thought that what Tori said would, would also be a takeaway for me, but just to not do the same thing, I think in addition to that, you know, you, you don't have, you, you lose so many weapons, but you still have an opportunity to be in the game or a chance to potentially win the game. Um, so you can't miss out on opportunities when you have so many things pinned against you. Right. So that would be my biggest takeaway, just missed opportunity. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was a very entertaining game. Um, but obviously, if you're not invested in the outcome and a Falcons fan, you obviously don't like what the final score was. But that, that first half was packed. Oh, yeah. And there was plenty of drama in the fourth quarter as well. A lot of things happened. We are going to break all of that down. But, but before we do, we have to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love like this Falcons Final Whistle Pod. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. And we're starting quarter number one, talking about a sequence of of events that's as strange as it gets and actually prompted Tori and I to to really examine the NFL rulebook. And we're talking about what happened in the fourth quarter. The, The Falcons were down two scores. They were mere inches really from cutting it to one score. Matt Ryan uh, is, is deemed to have given himself up just before the goal line and therefore um, is left out of the end zone after being, after the play being called on the field as a touchdown. Then he talks some trash or says some things that the referee doesn't like, gets a taunting flag. Then it goes under review. The touchdown or the the touchdown is removed, but the penalty remains. So then they go from, uh, the one-inch line to the 15-yard line because of that personal foul. The Falcons try to get in twice on third and goal from the 15. Can't do it. Can't do it on fourth and goal from the 15. And then the game was kind of over at that point. Uh, Tori, you wrote about 
this extensively uh, on the website, including what Matt Ryan had to say about the entire sequence of events, the entire endeavor. Yeah, and I'm going to try my very, very best to talk this through in a way that's not as convoluted as what it actually is because it's a very convoluted, honestly, like argument and then also understanding the rule. And and I would definitely suggest to you that you go, not to plug this, but it's going to be, it'll be better if you read the story that I wrote post game, because I think it'll be better than me talking it through. But what I'll essentially say is that in all honesty, the officiating crew actually called this the right way. Yeah. Like they got it right. Yeah. They got it right per the rules. And I think that's where you kind of get into the convolutedness and honestly, the vagueness of the NFL rule itself, because you know, first off, we'll call call you know the call short. He he, his knee is obviously down. However, there was a lot of argument like, oh well, he's a, a runner. Like you have to be down by contact. N- not n- not necessarily right. for the rule for the quarterback. It's any part of his body down, then he's down. And um, that was a rule that was updated in 2018. 2018, yes, and so. That in and of itself, and then there was a no call on a potential late hit that right. uh, I think, just from my vantage point, I think that was what Matt Ryan was kind of mad about, was that there was that late hit in the end zone, and he gets up and says something, you know, t- talking trash as somebody does, and that's when he gets the taunting penalty. And what's re- like what you were saying, what's really kind of the vagueness of the rule is that even though – Chances are Matt Ryan doesn't get called for taunting if he's down on the one yard line, <laughs> and then, it, it, like it's it's like the timing of it doesn't matter when it would have mattered in the live game scenario. Again, this is a really really convoluted tough topic. That's why I suggest you go read it because I do a better job of explaining it there. But it's, at at the end of the day, the rules are the rules, and, and Matt Ryan was he, he was like it's very disappointing. He was like I was very surprised that what I said was called taunting. This His is first taunting call first, ever. Yes, first taunting call ever. And he was like, it honestly surprised me. And I, I get that too, because I don't know what you can say that hasn't already been said in like the heat of the moment on a football field. Trust me, we've been around football players and coaches enough. Like we know what's said. Like I, I don't know what Matt Ryan could have said in that end zone that was – big enough for him to be called for a taunting. And that's exactly kind of what Matt was saying post game. But it, at the end of the day, he said, it doesn't really matter what what's called was called. It's the rule. Yeah. Chris, what was your takeaway? Just, just, just kind of watching this whole sequence unfold, what it meant and what happened. Yeah, I think, I think, well, I think like Tori said, the, the rule is the rule. He was down, but I did think the late hit, I thought the late hit was what a lot of people pointed to. If he was, totally. if he was giving, if he was giving himself up and then he was hit after he gave himself up, then there should have been a different kind of flag there. But I thought the, the taunting flag was, was fair. Um, I think that that's how it's been called all year. He kind I don't of know stood what, over him a little he bit. He did do that. Yeah, yeah. Know, and he kind of like that. tossed the ball towards him a little bit. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what he, it doesn't really matter what he said. I'm sure, I'm sure he didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we, we I don't I don't want to make it seem like we know him, but we know right. we've we've talked to him enough to know that he probably did. Well, actually, we don't. I I want to I would like to assume that he didn't say anything, you know, super offensive. I imagine he was just excited, and he might have screamed or something like that. But in general, how they've called it this year is that you you can't uh, taunt directly in front of someone, or you yeah. can't, you know, whether it be you're yelling like we saw um, a, a Chicago Bears player was you know, half the field from the Steelers sideline and he just looked in their direction and I, and I think said something and he was penalized for it. So if that's a penalty, then, then what Matt did today has to be a penalty. So I, I think, I think the, the, the call was fair. It was just, just a tough time for it to happen. And, and like you said, the rule is so complicated. Um, and, and just the situation was odd. Yeah, it yeah. was. And, and going back to kind of that late hit call, like that's not something that you can review. If it's not right. called on the field, you can't, go back and be like, oh, well, it was a late hit. Like, right. that's not something that's reviewable. So that I think that also adds to it that it's like, well, dang. Like, the whole sequence is just kind of so – the timing of it, it all, it's also weird. Yeah, especially because there's no way that he taunts anyone if if they don't throw their hands up that it's a touchdown. He's not taunting someone 
by a for landing at the one yard line. Right. So it's it's a sequence of events that somebody decided to chop up the timeline, edit it in like in essence, and apply certain things and right. negate other things. Um, I I know yeah. that we're over time here. I I just think it's, uh, Chris, do you, do you have some? No, no, I'm saying, yeah, I agree with what you're saying, my bet. Yeah, no, and I just think that we don't know if the Falcons would have come back and won that game. It didn't win or lose them that game. Well, I guess it did sort of lose it be, yeah. because they were down two scores with not enough time to come all the way back. But it, it was a very odd sequence. Arthur Smith, clearly not wanting to get fined, really stayed yeah. away from it as much as possible. I, <laughs> To be honest with you, I really would have liked to have heard his take. Maybe I would we, too. Um, maybe we'll hear more about it on, on in his Monday presser. Um, but I, it, it, it was a very strange sequence, not something that you see every day. Again, go uh, go back, read Tori's story uh, about it. A fascinating, pivotal moment in this game that uh, played out right in front of us and left a lot of fans and media members really scratching their heads. We're on to quarter number two and talking about the number four overall draft pick, the record breaker, the record setter, Kyle Pitts, who eclipsed 1,000 yards. Uh, it's four digits, and Kyle even said last week he never really thought he thought that number was so big that that he would never get there. He also set the Falcons franchise record for receiving yards by a rookie, beating out a certain guy who'll probably wear a gold jacket one day named Julio Jones. So that's another big thing. He had an amazing 61-yard catch and run down uh, down the sideline. Uh, pulled up with a hamstring issue later. Didn't play much at all. Was uh, in the uh, second half, I think, just the first series, and then he wasn't able to continue. This is one of those things where in that great play, Kyle Pitts shows what he can do and his value to the team. And then once he's not able to continue anymore, you really see yeah. his value to the team, especially when Hayden Hurst is unavailable. I'm very curious to see Lee Smith's snap count. Yeah, me too. I, we didn't see Lee Smith at all, hard, or hardly at all. I don't really remember. There was a lot of uh, – th- I'm very curious about that too yeah. because we didn't see him a lot. It was, so it was it was the Parker Hess show, mm-hmm. actually, kind of uh, the, the last man standing. A practice squad guy who was called up yesterday. Wow. Yesterday. There's a lot – going on there yeah. uh, for him. Uh, but nonetheless, Chris, uh, you know, losing Pitts, how much of an impact did that have? Yeah, well, I think well, I think it has a, has a big impact when you already look at the what they were coming into the game with without Hayden. Um, Calvin goes without saying, but, but and last week, the game that he had, it seems like, <clears throat> I know I say this, I think whenever someone has a good game, but it seemed like Matt was really going to him a lot last week. And then the first play of this game, they went to him and it was a design play to go to him. So it seemed like they were going to go to Kyle today. And then when he wasn't there, you have to adjust. And, and post game, Matt kind of made it seem like it wasn't a big thing, which which maybe it wasn't. But I, I think, you know, it still has some some effect on you when you're you're swapping out um Kyle Pitts and it's not it's it's not Hayden but it's it's Parker Hess who just got called up he didn't have an entire week to adjust to you know maybe put in certain packages that he's comfortable with but you're making this big adjustment and then you're asking more from other guys like Gage and Alameda and 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 they did step up but I think his absence played a big role and we saw that you know even on that third and 16 um that that's one of that's one of the reasons why he was drafted for to be that red zone guy who can go up and get the ball like a basketball player in the in like a rebound in the, in the end zone. And um, he, he wasn't able to do that there. So I think his, his presence was definitely missed. His absence was uh, felt. I absolutely agree. And I, I also agree with kind of what you're saying about how potentially I think, and this is my opinion, but I think Arthur Smith and Matt Ryan incredibly downplayed when they were asked about Kyle Pitt's absence. And I, I say that because I asked – I asked both Arthur and Matt, like how not having, not just not having Kyle, but not having Kyle, not having Hayden, not having Lee for some reason Mm -hmm. or another, how that impacted things. Because they run so many multiple tight end sets. That's been a marker of this offense for this entire year. So to not have multiple tight ends to go to, I, I mean, I was just kind of curious, like, you know, how does that affect play call and what you kind of hung your hat on to a certain degree of having these guys, even if they're not making huge impacts in the receiving game, they do have an impact on the field every single time that you throw out two, sometimes even three 
tight ends out there. So I, I was just very curious, and, and, and I know that, you know, when I asked Matt that question, he was just kind of like, well, like you can't really account for – what Kyle Pitts brings to this offense. You can't really replicate it because he's so special and different. But he was like, you know, our wide receivers stepped up and we've been able to move the ball down the field with our receivers and, and we were running the ball pretty well. And all of that was true. I thought the Falcons ran the ball pretty well today. But I also think that it wasn't one of those things that you could really I, – I just felt like there was a downplay of not having Kyle Pitts out there. Yeah, I, I think what it comes down to is they don't want to seem like they're making excuses or saying, oh, we're, we're, we're hurt or we're dealing with COVID situations or whatever the case may be, and therefore that's why we lost. I, I think that's admirable, but I think that there's room within the answers to say, yeah, that impacts the play calling. That yeah. is a scientific fact that if you look at it, and I, I'm not trying to – uh, throw shade at the names that I'm about to say, but on fourth and 15, Matt Ryan's throwing to Christian Blake. Yeah. On a shot down the field, down the sideline to try to get back into it, he's throwing to Frank Darby. Yeah. That's different than Ridley, Hurst, Pitts, Gage, the full complement that you would want to have going into a gotta win it game. Yep. And they didn't have it. Now, is that a reason why they lost or not? No, like we're not going to go down that road and make excuses for them either. But it's a factor. It is. It just is. And when you're trying to keep up with a Bills offense that's running the ball so well, mm -hmm. is scoring 29 points, getting to, getting to 29 points without that many skilled players yeah. is very difficult, especially against a defensive unit that can scheme against Patterson uh, without Pitts in there. Uh, Pitts' value is immense. This kid is, I mean, you all have, have, have seen it. He's uh, he's incredible, and uh, they definitely need him on the field. Uh, his hamstring injury will be something to watch as we move uh, forward throughout the final week of this regular season. We're starting quarter number three talking about the Falcons' defense, which is really starting to take the ball away on a regular. In a very odd drive chart for the Buffalo Bills. They didn't punt a single time. They either scored a touchdown yeah. or Josh Allen threw an interception. Which is wild. That's a wild stat. Now, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm going to say this other stat and then I'll get fact-checked down, but I think Josh Allen threw three interceptions in like four or five passes. It was very quick. It was. Bing, bang, bang. Yeah. Um, and Deron Harmon got one in the end zone. That led to a touchdown. Uh, and then oh, I'm blanking here. On AJ Trail. AJ Trail one. got one that led to a field goal. Uh -huh. And then Foye got one to start the second half that led to a three and out that I think in the grand scheme of things will get forgotten because yeah. it was in uh, Bill's territory. The The Falcons came away with nothing there. Yeah. And I think that that was a big swing. They were taking advantage of these takeaways. The defense has been doing good things, getting the ball back for their offense and for the offense to not turn that one around in a game like this, I think was costly. But uh, yeah, defense has been better creating turnovers it's been big and it's been impactful no it you're absolutely right that it has and something that I was very interested in is they were so impactful in these turnovers that it really made Buffalo reevaluate what they were doing offensively it did uh that was something that I thought was really really interesting is that you saw in that first half you, you saw Josh Allen slinging the ball left and right and, and then the Falcons come up with these three picks and they're tipping balls and, and, and they're kind of getting in uh, Josh Allen's throwing lanes and, and kind of just essentially creating wreaking havoc in a way that I thought was really impressive for this defense to do. But then you get into the second half and a, like a good team does Buffalo adjusted and they go to the run and they're just running the ball. I think they ended the, I'm looking at this. They ended the game with 233 rushing yards. Wow. Um, that is how many attempts. How many attempts? Uh, 44. And an average of? 5.3. That's the difference. It's like the Falcons' pass defense, I thought, was as good as maybe we've seen them all year. I think, despite being down several so guys. This, yeah, despite Jalen Hawkins not being out there, Fabian Moreau not being out there. I mean, they were really piecing it together. And the fact that they were able to do what they did in the first half and, and – uh, and cause Buffalo to reevaluate what they're doing and go go away from the pass in order to be effective just offensively, I thought was really good. But it's like when they make that turn, there needed to be an adjustment 
defensively as well to account for how much they were running the ball. Right. Uh, this defense, I do think, though, Chris, I'm curious if you uh, agree with me. I think that they've really made some significant strides down the stretch. 100%. Here, that, that this defense is really Im Im impacting games a lot more than they were uh, earlier in the year. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think you saw that today in terms they made they I think they confused Josh Allen today and yeah, you saw that term. with the in the red zone he the, the one play he threw he was running to his right and he just threw into like a sea of Falcons defenders <laughs> and I, <laughs> but I thought um but I thought they adjusted today early on too because early on Diggs was getting open often and it was it seemed pretty easy and it and and then they adjusted and then he wasn't but then in the second half, the, the bulk of those yards from the Bills came from Josh Allen. Yeah. So I don't really know how – well, not the bulk of them. The bulk of them came from Singletary at 110. But Josh Allen had 82 yards. When your quarterback is getting 82 yards, when your QB throws for 120 yards and three interceptions, I think his QBR was like a 15 or a 17. Like, on paper, that's a good day. But <laughs> if the guy has two touchdowns on the ground, I believe, yeah. and 80 – on the ground that's difficult and I'm and I feel like it was it's so because the way it looked it looked like the field it looked like no one could grip the ground on the field the field was icy and then you just have this huge six five uh, <laughs> right. dude running at you in the cold and he's just chucking away yards mm -hmm. chucking away yards and killing killing your killing you on the inside like it's a third down and he's coming down he's just chunks of yards and running you over when you've done everything in coverage to make sure that doesn't happen. So I thought that was really the difference on defense today and, and figuring out a way to, it kind of reminded me of, of what Sam Darnold did when they played the Panthers, except yeah. the running people over part, just the scrambling. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought up third down too, because that was also, I feel like with this, with this defense, they were having a hard time getting off the field on third down. They were even on third and long, even on third and long, they were seven for 12, which it, I realize is 58%. So just over half, but there was a point in time where it was like, there were five for six on third down. It would in it, it, that to me was really tough. And, it, and a lot of it, I do attribute to Josh Allen running the ball the, the way he did. He was getting big chunks when he took off. Yeah. And I, I think, one thing that the Falcons are going to have to improve on moving forward is dealing with mobile quarterbacks. 100%. Now, sometimes they scramble and cause problems. Sometimes there are design runs and they cause problems. But going back to Jalen Hurts in week one, that was identified early on as a problematic issue. They got better in, in some games and in some uh, instances, but clearly not good enough um, over the course of this season. Got to wrap that up. Mobile quarterbacks are not going away. They are coming in more and more often. You got to shore that up. And we're going to quarter number four, trying to play this thing forward and take a look at what this game means in the context of the season and uh, what the Falcons have to do to kind of uh, rebound from it or continue on from it. Well, there's only one game left. Mm -hmm. Season finale next week against the rival New Orleans Saints. They're coming off of a victory against the Panthers. Now it's about the response, right? That now that they've been mathematically eliminated from playoff contention, and you can say what you want. You can fire Jim Mora gifts at us all day about their worthiness for being in the playoffs. An undisputed fact is that this team was motivated by the postseason. Yeah. They just were. Yeah. They were playing meaningful games in December and now January. Yeah. And and you can't it doesn't matter how they got there. They were in the conversation. There's no denying that. Yeah, and uh, and I think that that is an important thing. Now, how they rebound with less to play for, that will be something of interest against the Saints. Fans will care a ton about that game, yeah. especially with the Saints having a, a possibility of making the postseason on the Falcons' home field. The yeah. rivalry is always felt more in the stands than on the field, but nonetheless, that's something that the Falcons are going – that they will want to do and the Falcons fans will, will really care about. Yeah. I actually think that this upcoming game is going to be pretty intense. Yeah. Uh, just because you think if you're the Falcons coming into it, it's like, what do we have to lose? Like, let's just throw the kitchen sink at them and, you know, try and ruin something for them. If that's your, it, it's your rival. And I know that that's how fans probably feel about it too. And honestly, there are a lot of guys on contract years, you know, yeah. who, who have to prove you know, have one one final chance to prove that 
they deserve a good chunk of a paycheck in 2022. You know, like that's also I, – I feel like, the, you know, even though the playoff motivation isn't there, there are some guys who are playing for their jobs. Sure. And, and I, I absolutely think that that, along with it being the Saints at home, with the Saints having something to play for, a postseason to potentially play for, I think all of that kind of meshes together – to create this environment that could potentially be pretty intense. I hope it's a, I hope it's intense. That's what good rivalries are. Yeah, and I I ultimately think that it will. Now now let's 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 get let's ready. One two three. <laughs> talk. Let's expand it beyond Sunday. Right. That again the carryover between January and July or August. Uh, oh on. gosh, yeah. Right. Like that seems crazy to to try to assume that. But I I would say. That for as much as we've lauded the Falcons for their performance in one score games, they're seven and two. They were two and eight a year ago. That's been key to them being in contention late, right? Their inability to get over the hump, I think, has a lot to do with their performance against top teams. Yep. Uh, they have every team that they've played this season, uh, the Bucks twice, 49ers, Cowboys, Patriots, and these Bills and the Eagles, who currently occupy a playoff seed. Mm hmm. They lost two by double digits. Yep. All of them. Yep. Every single one over over the course of the season. They have no wins against teams with, with winning records right now. Um, and that has to get better. Now, the way that's a here that's kind of like a two way thing, right? That the Falcons need to do better against top top competition. They've also checked the box of taking care of teams below them. Mm -hmm. So if they can increase their talent level. And I, I think with the good coaching that they have, that they can compete with, with better teams if they get more talent. It's going to be a major offseason, I think, for the Falcons to achieve that aim. And uh, that's an area where they're going to have to get better. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I mean, when you try to look at what they've done this season and what they need to do maybe, you know, to reach the playoffs next year or just to take that next step in the evolution, are there any kind of keys that, that, that you've seen from this game or from this team uh, in general about how they can take those next steps? Yeah, well, I think I know you said that – I know you said that, you know, January – how is January going to help you for August and next year and things like that? But I, I do think there's value in the, the way players respond on Sunday, the way – not only players, but the way coaches respond. And also uh, that builds trust between a player and a coach or a coach and a player, you know, depending on how Arthur Smith approached this approaches this week or DMPs or whoever, you name it. Um, the players will recognize that the players who will be here will recognize that, you know, how serious is, is the coach taking this? Are they taking stuff off and then vice versa? Um, how serious are these players taking this? Are they, you know, and, that, and that'll lead into next year. But also, I think what what better party to ruin than the, than the Saints party on Sunday? You know, if I think even without the playoffs, and like we said, we knew that the that the that they were playing for the playoffs, and that this team really believed that they were going to get in, and you could tell that by how defeated they sounded after losses. Like I just have that image of Deron Harmon at the podium oh, in yeah. Sanford. Like he was like. He was defeated like he like so this team really believed that they had a chance at the playoffs, but the great now they have a chance to ruin somebody else's fun and and it's the Saints. And I think that matters a, a divisional matchup a rival, It's something to play for. And I do think while it's not momentum you can build off, but uh, the way that the players and the coaches approach, I think this week and this game can have a lasting impact while it, it might be over five months, however much my math's not right. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm not good with math either. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. But so I, I think it can have some impact, totally. albeit so, so long um, from January. Yeah. It's, it, I, I think it's going to be, as, as Tori said, it's going to be intense. I hope so. I, I think that that is a good term for it. I know Falcons fans are going to want the home team uh, to, uh, to beat their rival. And we are going to break that game down in the season finale. Oh, it's going to be the last one. Of the, fi of, of the Falcons, Falcons schedule final. and of the Falcons final as yeah. a podcast yeah. uh, coming up next week. But before we get there, you should still. We got to do something. Oh, no, I was going to say, we got to do something special for that. I don't know what we oh have to do. We, gotta do special. Maybe we're get, uh, we should play a game. Yeah. Play a game. We could get fans involved. Who knows? Maybe, yeah, we'll uh, figure know. something out. We'll, we'll figure something <laughs> special out for you guys. And definitely let you know. Uh before we get to that pod, do what we uh, always like you to do, which is give us a five-star rating and a review. Be sure to do the same thing for Falcons Audible with Dave Archer, DJ, 
Rackley, and DJ Shockley. Um, subscribe, and of course, stay tuned next Sunday for another drop of the Falcons' final whistle, and we will talk to you then. Talk to you next week.